Hello, everybody. I'm Chris Harding. I'm the Open Group's Director for Interoperability, uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Open Group webinar on using TOGAF to define and govern service-oriented architectures. SOA is a key enabler of interoperability, uh, and we have had a work group on SOA in the Open Group for some years now. From the inception of that work group, it was recognized that the key value, the, the largest value that it could deliver to the architecture community uh, was to give advice on the use of TOGAF for SOA, uh, and that was the subject of the practical guide, uh, the guide to uh, using TOGAF to define and uh, govern service-oriented architectures that we published uh, a little earlier this year uh, and which is the subject of this webinar. The uh, webinar will be presented by Ed Harrington of Architecting the Enterprise uh, and he will, uh, he will explain uh, the, the use of TOGAF uh, for SOA uh, as covered in the, in the published guide. Uh, and uh, we also have other experts on the panel, including Steve Bennett of Oracle. Once the presentation is complete, uh, there will be a question and answer session in which our experts will uh, try to answer uh, any questions that you may have. If you do have a question, uh, and please think as we go through the, the presentation about anything that needs asking about. Uh, if you do have a question, please could you use the Q&A facility on the WebEx uh, to put that question, um, asking the question, making it uh, visible to all participants so that everybody can see the, uh, the stream of what is going on. Okay, and I see we have been uh, joined by Ewell Dicko, who will also be a panelist and who was one of the uh, he is from the Bank of Montreal, uh, and he will be, uh, he was one of the co-chairs of the project that developed the practical guide. Okay, so without further ado, I will hand over to Ed, who will take us through um, this part of the presentation. Uh, just some logistics, Chris, first. I've got an email message from Dave Hornford, who is trying to get on as a panelist. He is on as a regular attendee, but not as a panelist. And Matt's apparently is trying to get on as well. Uh, okay. Um, be two of our additional panelists. Right. Give me those names again, please, Ed. It's Dave Hornford. Yep. And uh, uh, Matt's, I'll spell his last name. Matt Genival. Genival. G E J N A V A L. And uh, uh, Dave will be, in fact, uh, giving a part of the presentation uh, once Ed has uh, has been through the first part. So uh, I'm sorry, just just uh, who's the second name, and I'll, I'll escalate to a panelist. Okay, so perhaps uh, we can sort that in the background, uh, Simon, while uh, Ed gets started. Okay, that's fine. All right, shall do. Uh, uh, I'm a trainer and, and a consultant with Architect Me Enterprise, and that's the uh, extent of my uh, marketing for, uh, for, for this. Uh, we're going to talk about something that uh, a number of us put together, uh, looking at using TOGAF to define and govern service-oriented architectures. Why enterprise architecture and SOA? Well, much of the work that has been claimed to be done as SOA uh, over the last few years has really not been SOA. It has primarily ignored the A in SOA, the architecture piece, and we've ended up with a proliferation of web services. So one of the things that we're trying to emphasize by linking together SOA and TOGAF is the A, the architecture piece. So we're trying to avoid the scope of SOA being just individual projects, just individual web services. 
we're trying to get a consistent use of SOA across the enterprise. Uh, we're trying to connect SOA to the bigger business problems, not just the little web services that prolifer proliferate uh, quite readily and easily. Obviously, one of the big things that TOGAF talks about is reuse, and SOA is probably one of the best and major candidates for reuse. It's one of the things that SOA has touted to be. Uh, but it also costs quite a bit. Uh, the infrastructure to support SOA from ESBs and directory services and all of this stuff uh, costs a lot of money, and you need justification for that investment, which will eventually, we hope, end up delivering the expected business value that SOA has been touting for five or six years now. So for those of you who don't know TOGAF, who aren't familiar with TOGAF, uh, we're not going to be able to teach you all there is about TOGAF uh, in you know, less than an hour, uh, but it's a detailed method for and supporting tools for doing enterprise architecture. It is a compendium of good and best practices that have evolved over 15, 16 years. Uh, it's used by 80% of the Fortune Global 50. Most impressive, there are more than 15,000 certified individuals in TOGAF. What we're going to focus on is what is the core of TOGAF. The core, the core of TOGAF is the architecture development method, the ADM, which breaks complex processes of architecture development into hopefully a number of simpler, smaller steps called phases in which the architect actually considers different aspects of the overall problem. The guide in a nutshell, what is it all about? Well, it's adoption of the TOGAF ADM to SOA. It's trying to take a best practice view of SOA in all the ADM phases to manage the concerns of the SOA stakeholders. Uh, one of the things that TOGAF really focuses on is uh, how you manage and address your stakeholder concerns through uh, views and viewpoints, through artifacts that you deliver that hopefully will address the concerns of your stakeholders. Uh, it is an adaption and an adoption with an extension of the TOGAF core current meta model for SOA. We've, uh, we've extended the meta model in a couple of areas, just particularly for service-oriented architectures. Uh, we've also looked at doing SOA at different architectural levels. Uh, TOGAF talks about the strategic level, the segment level, and the capability level. And so what we've done is approach SOA from those same three levels. Uh, and we've also tried to connect uh, the practical guide, TOGAF, with other work that the work group has, uh, has developed and either has delivered as uh, standards or is in the process of delivering as standards, such as the, the governance framework, which is a standard, the uh, maturity model, the open group service integration maturity model, uh, the reference architecture, which is about to be uh, uh, published as a standard. We're hoping that that will happen next month in October. And we're working on SOA and security. And with this one, we're also working with the cloud as well. So a phased approach to uh, SOA. And TOGAF has nine phases that, uh, that go from a preliminary phase to all the way down to phase H, architecture change management. In the preliminary phase, you're basically setting up the infrastructure for doing enterprise architecture or for doing SOA in this case. Uh, so you're establishing things like governance, your principles, things like that. Phase A, the architecture phase, you're establishing specific SOA projects that would uh, hopefully go across uh, the, the organization from an enterprise perspective. Uh, what you're really doing in the architecture vision phase is establishing a vision for what you want to do and getting the sign-off and budget to actually go ahead and do the work. 
Then you have the architecture development phases, which are phases B, C, and D, where you take a different perspective on the architecture that you're de developing. Phase B, you're looking at it from the perspective of the business. Phase C, you're looking at it from the perspective of applications and information. And phase D, you're looking at it from the perspective of technology. Then phases E and F, you're actually going ahead and doing your detailed planning, getting ready, working with the, uh, the project management office to get what you've planned out, what you've architected, implemented. Phase G, it's being implemented and you're providing governance over it as the implementation takes place. And then in phase H, uh, you're keeping it fit for purpose. So in a little more detail, the preliminary phase, uh, you're doing basically four or five major tasks. You're setting up the infrastructure, as I said earlier, to actually do enterprise architecture and enterprise architecture in terms of SOA. So you're establishing principles. And in uh, the, the guide, we come up with an additional principle, and that's a principle of service orientation, and that's defined in the guide itself. By the way, the guide is uh, freely available. I think you just have to register for it at the uh, Open Group website in, in all of its detail. You're looking at, is the organization really ready to do SOA? And the Open Group Service Integration Maturity Model is a seven by seven uh, maturity uh, model. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, standard uh, maturity models. This is a you know, seven levels of maturity and seven areas of measurement of those levels of maturity. Then there's the open group SOA governance model where you can take and adapt your own internal governance for those aspects of SOA that are important from a governance perspective. Then another thing you do is you, in the preliminary phase, is you adapt TOGAF to your organization. No one takes TOGAF out of the box. TOGAF is utilized as it best fits with the individual's organizations and the organization takes from it what will provide added value. And one of the things that we've done is we've come up with a high-level SOA reference architecture that will help you adapt TOGAF to do SOA. And finally, uh, we talk about establishing the initial print, uh, footprint of the organization as a SOA uh, center of excellence. This is the adaptation in what we're saying, the TOGAF style, of the TOGAF meta model for SOA. We have added, in essence, I think four uh, individual entities to the standard TOGAF 9 meta model. And those entities are an information entity in the business architecture, which talks about information communicated about within the business and an information component, which is a grouping of uh, individual information entities, again, from a SOA perspective. We've added an IS service contract in the applications uh, area of the meta model. Uh, we have service contract in the business area of the, the meta model, but this is the IS service contract be between the consumer of the IS service and the provider, and it establishes the functional and non-functional parameters for interaction at the applications level. Then we've added a depiction of the actual SOA solution. Then we have two other areas, service quality and location, which exist in the current meta model, but we've emphasized for their importance. Service quality, uh, the object is used to, uh, as an attribute to services, components, and contracts and location becomes very important for understanding where the services are available from. So stepping through the preliminary phase, and I'm gonna quickly go through uh, each of the phases for you and talk about anything that has changed in the phases for SOA in particular. And so 
would talk about are there additional objectives in the phase? Are there additional inputs? Are there additional steps? Are there additional outputs? So if we look at the preliminary phase, we're looking at objective is ensure SOA supporting principles are in place as well as SOA governance. Uh, on the input side, we're looking at the SOA reference architecture, as previous men previously mentioned, as well as the maturity model, uh, the SOA governance framework, and any industry best practices around SOA. The steps are not changed per se, but we've just emphasized SOA aspects. So you're identifying your stakeholders' concerns from a service orientation perspective. You're defining the scope. You're ensuring the scope is SOA appropriate. Uh, you're tailing your deliverables to the, the, the level of architecture that you're developing. You're evaluating your own business, business capabilities. Are you ready to do SOA? Uh, and you're confirming your principles. And then on the output side, uh, you'll end up with a statement of architecture work with SOA as an approach. You'll end up with your updated architecture principles, a capability assessment, a vision for doing architecture with SOA-based thinking in it. Uh, you'll have additional content that will populate your uh, architecture repository. So that's the preliminary phase. Phase A, you're actually starting to do individual SOA projects. Now these pro projects could be of a strategic nature, they could be at a segment level, or they could be at a capability level. Most projects of this type, however, are really done at the capability level. So what you're doing, what you're trying to do in this phase is ensuring that you've got all the information you need uh, to go ahead and get appropriate sign-offs and budgets to do the projects that you want to do. So as inputs, you've got everything that came before, everything that was done in the preliminary phase. Uh, the steps, you're identifying specific t stakeholders for these SOA projects. What are the SOA special concerns that might exist? You're defining the scope of the projects. You're evaluating your business capabilities. Again, are we SOA ready? and uh, you're confirming your principles that you developed in the preliminary phase. Uh, the outputs, uh, you hopefully will have a signed off statement of architecture work with SOA specifically as the approach that you're taking. Uh, you'll have architecture principles, your capability assessments, your vision, uh, all of these confirmed for the projects, the individual projects that you are envisioning doing. Then we move on to the actual architecture development phases, phases B, C, and D. In these, we're doing architecture work, but from four different perspectives. We're doing it from a business perspective. We're doing it from a uh, applications perspective, from an information or data perspective, and from a technology perspective. And what you'll see here is in addition to the objectives, uh, and the inputs, phases, and outputs, and I'll go advance the next slide, we'll talk about specific artifacts that you may want to consider to address the concerns of your stakeholders. But going back to the phase B enhancements, well, with, there's no additional objective material. However, we look at things like the organization, organizational model, where you've got the SOA Center of Excellence. You've tailored your architecture framework, you're using it here now, these are all inputs. Uh, the steps, you're gonna select reference models, viewpoints, tools, artifacts that you're gonna develop to address the concerns specifically of your uh, SOA stakeholders. As outputs, uh, you'll have gone back and, and validated your principles again, You'll have uh, a target business architecture. You have a baseline and target business architectures. Uh, you'll have a gap analysis from a business perspective, and you'll put together a roadmap. Uh, the outputs may include some of the diagrams listed here. And if we go on to the next page, uh, 
we talk about some of the artifacts, some of which exist in TOGAF today, uh, but would be modified specifically for SOA. Some of these are new. For instance, uh, the business vocabulary catalog, that is, that is new. The business service location catalog is not new, but it has more emphasis on location since you want to know where the business services, uh, where the SOA services are located and uh, how you uh, access them. Uh, things like an event process catalog is not new, but uh, the business service information matrix is new because information uh, is a new entity within the uh, business area of the meta model. So this just gives you an idea of some artifacts, their purpose, and what meta model entities are utilized uh, in those uh, artifacts. And you'll see for the re rest of the uh, uh, phases in the ADM, we'll take this approach. We'll start with phase C, what are the enhancements uh, from an objective input step and output perspective, and uh, then we, we go on pretty rapidly to what are the additional artifacts. And uh, this publication, or, or this presentation rather, uh, will be available, and Simon will let you all know how that will be available uh, at, at the, the end of the, uh, at the end of the presentation. And uh, it's also, all of this content is within the actual publication, within the practical guide publication itself. So in phase C, you're looking at both applications and data, and we've extended the application section to include applications and services. Again, the inputs are everything that has gone before, including the business uh, architecture, uh, as is and to be, gaps and roadmaps that you've developed in the previous phase B. The steps you go through are basically the same as you went through in B. You will uh, look at your reference models, your viewpoints, you'll develop your uh, your specific artifacts to address the concerns of your data and uh, applications and services uh, stakeholders, and you'll come out with a uh, as is a target, gaps, and roadmaps from both a data and an applications and services perspective. And so we go on to the phase C artifacts. Uh, we talk about things like an IS in, a service integration diagram. That is new. Uh, business process IS service matrix, which is not new. Uh, so again, we have a mixture of some new and some uh, existing artifacts that are called out by TOGAF, uh, but they're really targeted in this case for service orientation specifically for SOA and the development of SOA as architecture. Uh, you have a logical SOA solution diagram. You have an IS service distribution matrix. Moving on to phase D, uh, there are really no additional objective materials, but phase D is going to be very important because here we're talking about the underlying infrastructure that is needed to support SOA. So here you're going to have things like uh, uh, you know, enterprise service buses, uh, UDDI directories, if you're going standards-based, things that may not exist in your current technology base, which you will need to have in place in order to support uh, uh, your, your SOA focus. So uh, again, everything that's gone before is an input including all the work you've done in the business architecture as well as in the data and applications architecture. Uh, the steps are, again, uh, similar, however, with an emphasis on SOA. Here we have, however, a sp have developed within the uh, open group, SOA work group, a specific service-oriented infrastructure reference model. Uh, that reference model, TOGAF 
9 says that uh, to do uh, technology architecture, you really should have a technology reference model. TOGAF suggests one, uh, but it's been, it's been around for a while and needs updating. So what we've done for SOA is we've actually come up with an infrastructure reference model for SOA, and uh, that is in the process of being, publishing, being published uh, uh, momentarily, I think. I think and hope it's going to be published in October. Uh, and then your outputs are, again, you're going to have uh, an as-is, to-be technology architecture perspective that hopefully will deliver the business value that you've identified in phases in phase B. And only two new artifacts here, a logical technology architecture diagram and a logical application and technology matrix. Moving on to phase E, uh, phase E you're basically getting stuff ready to be built. Here is the, the first phase where you're actually concerned with how this service-oriented uh, architecture is going to be put in place. Uh, so there, the, the objectives of phase A, there are no, nothing, nothing new here. Uh, as you would expect, all the architecture development work that you did in phases B, C, and D are inputs, uh, including the separate uh, gap analyses and uh, roadmaps. In phase E, you will take the gap analyses and roadmaps and you'll consolidate them and rationalize them. Uh, and uh, that will be done again here from a, a SOA perspective. And you start really talking about what is the SOA solution that is going to be developed. So the steps include, you know, what reference model, viewpoints and tools do I need, need to create? Uh, where is my physical data component? What are my physical application components? What are my technology application components, and what's the SOA solution that we're targeting? Uh, and as outputs, again, we have a list of potential uh, artifacts that you may include, you know, SOA solutions matrix, a SOA solutions diagram, et cetera, that we show in the phase E artifacts. Many of these are new, especially when you get down to uh, a technology guidelines and application guidelines. Uh, those are those are brand new call-outs uh, for uh, the doing SOA in uh, in in, uh, in TOGAF. That is it for my piece of the presentation, and I think I just about got it on time. There, uh, Chris, are you still with us? I think we may have lost Chris Harding. In any case, uh, Simon, I need to turn this over now to... Uh, yeah, Chris is back on. Oh, hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I dropped off momentarily. Um, Dave Hornford, in fact, will be um, taking the next slides, I think, uh, since he has joined us. Um, uh, Dave, perhaps you could introduce yourself briefly and then uh, explain about the importance of the changes to the meta model. Certainly. Um, I was wondering if Ed could keep control of the slide deck for me. It would make my life easier. Simon, if you give it back to me, I'll do that. Thank you. You ready to go, Dave? Yep, ready to go. Can you go ahead and slide 21? While Ed is moving to the meta model, my name is Dave Hornford. I'm the chair of the Open Group Architecture Forum in terms of Open Group activity. I was co-chair of this project, and I'm the senior partner for architecture for Connexium, a consulting firm. What I'm going to talk about is the underpinning meta model of what we need to describe in order to describe and enterprise architecture. For the service-oriented architecture guide for TOGAP, the core of it are the entities and the relationships of the entities that are required to be described. What's being shown is the TOGAP out-of-the-box meta model with a set of entities, role, process, event, service quality, contract, and so forth highlighted. Those entities exist within TOGAF today. 
what they do, what we're highlighting is that those entities are very important from the perspective of doing SOA. There's a shortage of what we need in order to properly describe our architecture. Ed earlier showed a slide which looked like this that had a few extra entities which he identified added on. Those entities were the ones that were missing. And if we go to slide 22, we see a slightly different view, which is a UML-like relationship of the different entities. And they're color-coded so that in yellow, we have business architecture. In green, we have applications architecture and so forth. The ones that have the dashed box around them are the entities that were needed to end out the comprehensive description. This slide peels off all of the other entities. It's not to suggest that those entities are not important. It's that these ones that we're highlighting for the purposes of doing service-oriented architecture. There's also, if you read the guide, an underpinning assumption that standard motivational elements, your strategy, your drivers, your objectives are included and are are aligned to every one of these entities. What I'm going to spend the next few minutes is going through the different pieces in a little bit more detail. So if you can go to 23, Ed, and we'll zoom in close enough so that it's um, almost legible. <laughs> in, it's there, Dave. I know. Um, when we're, we're looking at what you need to do to describe the business architecture, the minimum components that you have to describe in order to do service-oriented architecture. The center of it are business services. What are the services that the business delivers, which will consist of different processes? Once we understand what our business is delivering, what are the processes that are used to deliver those services? What are the events that trigger the processes who the actors are that deliver the services, we're in a position to move forward and actually understand the underpinning IT asset required to deliver the business. What was missing inside TOGAF in, in the description in business was information. We've got the business services, their quality, their location, who performs them, what triggers them, what are the underpinning processes, and what we added in which is at the bottom of the, the slide with the dashed lines around it, are the information entities and the information components. What is the information that needs to move around in order for the processes and the services to be delivered? And at this point, we're talking about information. We're not talking about data. And we need to be very clear that there's a distinction. Processes, services, actors use information. They don't use the data elements. If we move on to the next slide, number 24, when we start talking in TOGAF terms about the information systems architecture, our applications and our data, now we're in a position to draw the linkages between our data and the information a process or a service consumes. There's also a direct linkage from the business services to the information system services. And in both cases, we're keeping track of subordinate entities. What are the measures? What are the qualities? Where is this happening? Because if we have an informa a business service, and it happens in my country, Canada, that, is, that locational information becomes very important when we're delivering the underpinning information system service. And those underpinning system services require a contract in all cases. What is the terms of use? What is the terms of provision? What is the service provider signing up for? And what is the consumer signing up for? So that we're able to build out the architecture that supports what the business is trying to accomplish. Underpinning the um, meta model is the logical application components because at the end of the day, we have all these services. Something has to deliver them. Same regard that we have in the business service Processes and actors deliver. Logical application components deliver. And our information must be processed by those logical application components as data elements. 
Moving to number 25, Ed, slide D or phase D. What are we chasing in our minimum architecture entities that we have to describe? What services are provided by the platform? What does our infrastructure provide? Are there location services? Are there directory services? Are there message transformation services? Are there security services that are going to be realized by those logical technology components that will support and deliver those logical application components. Again, managing that abstraction from the service to the logical components so that we're able to move forward. There's nothing new added in here. This is standard out of the box enterprise architecture. And a good enterprise architecture readily delivers good signature. The biggest changes I want to spend a bit of time is in phase E, slide 26. And here, from the purposes of providing guidance to delivering source-oriented architectures, where we made, in many regards, the largest departure from out-of-the-box TOGAP. Out-of-the-box TOGAP suggests that the physical data components, physical application components, and physical technology components are described in phases B, C, and D, respectively. You're describing your data and your applications as part of the applications architecture and your technology as part of the technology architecture. What we suggest for the best development of service-oriented architecture is a modification and moving those descriptions and understanding the physical realization to phase E. In TOGAM's phase E, it's called opportunities and solutions and the core deliverable from this is understanding what it will take to realize the target state. What is the roadmap? Anytime we're looking at realization, we're looking at the real world. We're looking at the physical components that have to be implemented and describing them here, whether it's physical data, physical applications, allows us to isolate when we're doing architecture work, the conceptual and the logical work we're doing in phases B, C, and D from the physical realization architecture we're doing in phases E. Design work still is later, but at this point, how does this pin together? And the added on element that needs to be described is a SOA solution, because we need to keep track of our services, our information system services logically, and we need to keep track of a SOA solution that is realized by different physical components. And that's a new addition, which allows the practitioner to then come out of phase E with a clear concept of how the target will be realized. And the important thing to realize and do as you're working your way through this is that each of these entities may need to be described in a current state and a target. Where do we want to get to? What will it take in order to realize the vision that was identified in phase A? to meet the objectives of our stakeholders, to meet the strategy of the business. What is the target? Phase E, lining up the physical components that need either to be developed, changed, or eliminated to realize it, and keeping track of the realized solutions. That's a quick walk through the underpinning of the meta model. And the key guidance from the practical guide is be very clear about what you need to describe and how you will describe it in order to understand your architecture so that you can realize the objectives of the business. Thank you very much, Chris. I'll pass on the baton to our next uh, person. Thank you, Dave. Um, and in fact, we have now come to the Q&A part of this webinar. Um, we have a, a, a number of questions posted online. Um, and uh, please, if, if people have other questions, uh, please use the, the Q&A feature of the WebEx to put those questions to the panel, um, making them visible to all participants so that everyone can see what the questions are. Uh, in fact, um, we can start with uh, a couple of the questions uh, don't need an answer from the panel. Uh, they were questions about where is the practical guide itself available uh, and uh, about the presentation slides from this, this webinar, where, where will they be available? Um, I posted a, an answer to the first of those 
uh, with URLs for where you can retrieve, uh, obtain a copy of the PDF if you want to download that, um, or uh, uh, where you can uh, browse the HTML version of the practical guide online. Um, and uh, uh, also given the general location where you'll be able to find the presentation slides, Simon will be um, sending email to everybody with the actual URL uh, after the webinar. So uh, perhaps we can then move on to um, a question. Perhaps the best one to start with is the, the one from Gildner Johnson. Uh, is there a summary of how many TOGAF changes were made? Uh, a summary of changes would be useful. And perhaps the, uh, the three panelists who haven't yet uh, uh, spoken um, could start with the answers to this. Um, and perhaps if you could just uh, give yourself a little bit of a brief introduction when you do so, so that everyone can, uh, can understand who you are. So, um, uh, Awol, Steve, uh, uh, and, and Matt, um, do you have any thoughts on the best way to find a summary of the changes? I'll, I'll step in here. Hi, this is uh, Stephen Bennett. I'm a senior enterprise architect at Oracle, uh, currently focusing on SOA information management and uh, cloud computing. Um, we, don't, we don't have a, a one-pager of where we've actually uh, made changes. Um, what we have done in the document is literally highlight um, in the appendix the changes we did by phases. And, and graphically, we obviously show what, what new entities we actually added to the meta model. Um, so uh, depending on what phases you really want to focus on, which ones you want to, uh, to utilize. And what, one key note here is even though we have actually uh, uh, customized TOGAF uh, with SOA, it, it's still up to the practitioner to take uh, our extensions and obviously to customize it for their environment as well. Okay, uh, does anyone want to add to that at all? If not, we could move to... I, um, I would just say, we, uh, Chris has said, that we, we really focused on the ADM, as you can tell from the, from the presentation, on the architecture development method. And uh, so the, the, the major changes are in the meta model itself, and in the additional uh, artifacts that we that we point to in the uh, in, in the various so in, in, in fact, it might be fair to say that the the presentation is is the best starting point to understand what the changes are. Um, perhaps we can move on then to. Uh, in fact, there are two questions um, which are perhaps a little bit related. Um, the first one. Um, first one, which was asked quite a while ago, so I'm finding difficulty to find it uh, at the beginning. Uh, will there be an EPF version of TOGAF that is uh, adapted to SOA? That's from uh, Paul Schmedes. And then um, there's a further, uh, a further question from Pranab uh, Barua. Are SOA uh, tool vendors on board? Uh, to implement the meta model, um, and uh, from Peter Bradbury, has the work, work group been working with any tool vendors, and if so, have any explored adoption within these tools? So perhaps um, we could ask the panelists generally um, to comment on how the practical guide might translate into a tooling environment, um, and uh, uh, if there are any any specific um, uh, tools or connections to tools that they know of. Uh, uh, this is Matt Scannewell. I'm, I'm the uh, co-chair of the uh, SOA working group. Uh, there aren't, as, as Ed mentioned earlier, there weren't many changes that were made to, to the TOGAF meta model. So it's basically two or three new entities. and. Uh, uh, that they would be reasonably easy uh, to, to add, and, and there's actually projects ongoing within the open group. Uh, uh, there will be changes to TOGAF in itself in, in the future, and, and information architecture will be added to TOGAF uh, uh, 
as a, as a full discipline and, and maybe as a full phase, it's unclear what will happen yet. But uh, the, the main change is around information. The need for, for, for having a clear understanding of, of the information and the information structure that's going to be used by all SOA services. Uh, but when it comes to, to meta model and, and tooling, it's, a, it's also a project, uh, a TOGAF meta model project or, uh, with the tool vendors where the open group has created a, uh, a, a, a set of uh, uh, restrictions to put on tool vendors so they should be, uh, be able to, to uh, uh, put a stamp on their tools to be TOGAF uh, uh, certified. Dave, you probably know more about that than I do. Um, yes, the tool certification standard is currently undergoing what's called company review inside the group, um, and it is a broad view of, of conformance for certification for a tool to be used with TOGAF. Um, one of the proposed conformance requirements is the ability to extend the meta model, which would be the ability to add the four new, four or five new entities. Okay, so no, no specific tools there, but a general mechanism by which uh, tool vendors um, could plug into this uh, by extending the, the meta model and uh, uh, and could achieve certification uh, of their products, uh, not SOA, but but in a TOGAF context. Yes. Um, and of course, of course, this meta model and, and the TOGAF meta model and, and the meta model, the extensions we put in, as uh, he was saying before, it's all adaptable, and, and this is one suggestion, and one best practice that we suggest that uh, it needs to be adapted to the, the needs of, of every individual organization. Okay. Uh, unless anyone else wants to leap in, perhaps we could move um, to there's one question I think we can deal with fairly quickly. Is SAO a typo of SOA, or is it a relevant distinct abstract? Uh, I'm not quite sure where you've seen this, but I'm pretty sure it must be a typo of SOA. Uh, so uh, hopefully that, that can clarify that. Um, okay, so there's a question from Hussein Chinoy here. Is there a generic vendor component, ESB, registry, repository, runtime proxy, uh, mapping to TOGAF phases or meta model components? Um, I don't know who would like to take that, but uh, it's an interesting question. There's, 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 no, there's no mapping of uh, vendor, com generic vendor components to, to phases or the meta models, but what, what you will see on the slide that's above here, and it's pretty hard to read, on the right hand side, uh, one of the projects that we uh, we relate to is the SOA reference architecture. And what that reference uh, architecture does is define the capabilities uh, that are required and map the relevant components to that. So what uh, what work that we've done here is you actually refer to that, and that when we when we say stuff like platform service and logical technical components, that's actually going to be realised through and be an instantiation of what your reference architecture looks like. And in the preliminary phase, we actually said one of the inputs was to bring your, your, your own SOA reference architecture. Okay. But the, the, the SOA reference architecture don't go down to, to any vendor components uh, right now. In the future, the, the, the SOA reference architecture is, is just being... Uh, uh, made ready for company review and will be released uh, reasonably soon. And I, I imagine that the next step would, could be that different vendors would map to the, the that SOA reference architecture and show how they fulfill it. Okay. Any further comments on that question? 
Um, if, if, if you look at the map, mapping to different spaces, see, the color schemes on, on, on the slide we can look at is, is really mapped to spaces. So the, the meta model object, the, the yellow ones are business, the greenish, light greenish ones are, are uh, information application ones, the red ones are data, uh, the uh, blue ones, uh, blue ones uh, are are phase D ones, and the, the black ones or the, the dark ones are phase E, and the green ones mm -hmm. surrounding it is are the different projects. Uh, that are uh, how the the input how the output from from the photograph work the architecture work you you would be doing would be input to to different types of uh, uh, SOA projects that are ongoing within the open group. Okay, perhaps another thing to mention uh, regarding specific components. Uh, in fact, it, it was mentioned briefly earlier. Um, the we are. Uh, in the final stages of uh, preparing an SOA reference architecture, um, and that will provide another context in which people can place specific SOA components and perhaps can assist people with uh, identifying how those components might map into their architecture. Um, there are another two questions here which perhaps we can consider together because uh, they are linked, um, or the, the, there is a linkage between them. Um, does the practical guide include an example of implementing TOGAF slash SOA in a fictitious company rather than just description of who, what should be implemented? Uh, that's from Wilson too. And from Stephen King, do you have any practical examples or case studies of this in use? So it's a question of um, examples showing the, the use of the, uh, of the guide uh, either fictitious examples or real ones. Um, if, if perhaps the panel can can comment on that. Hey, well, you've been uh, been very quiet uh, up to now. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the practical guide in in actual use? Ah, I see Abel's um, on, on the web, but not on the phone, so uh, that's probably why he's been quiet. I'm not quite sure what the, the problem is there. Um, we, we, we started uh, in, in the beginning or in the middle of, of the development of the practical guy. We, we were discussing an example, but it, it's, uh, to, to do a, a good example, it takes a, a really huge effort. Uh, and to do a small example usually doesn't give you anything. So the problem is to find the appropriate level of example that really shows all the benefits of this. Plus, it, it doesn't take you uh, the same amount of time that the, the normal architecture project would, would uh, demand. Okay, so we did in fact but we, we have it as, as a possible uh, 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 next Step in, in the practical guide is it would be could be to develop a, an example and and if anyone wants to participate in in doing that, please let us know and, and we'll be happy to to let you participate in that work. Okay, uh, and that's a lead into another question about how we can get involved. But perhaps we can. Um, move on there's, there's been a flood of questions coming in and I don't think that uh, we are going to be able to um, to deal with them all a uh, question here from Pranab Barua is there any effort in TOGAF to rationalize the SOA approach with ITIL v3 uh, and I think the short answer to that is is no unless any of the panelists wants to leap in and, and contradict me on that um, we, we had in, in the governance project we we looked at ITIL v3 and and and, and the relationships to to, to 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 our governance and so that that was uh, an approach we looked at. We also looked at uh, uh, COVID as a uh, used COVID as, as a as a reference when we started the work. 
Right, and we did on, some quite extensive work on both ITIL and, and COVID, but they didn't actually make their way into the final output. Uh, it was just something we did as, as, as understanding the context. Um, there there is also, work? Chris, um, the Open well. Group actually done, have done the effort to actually map TOGAF to ITIL v3, and that white paper right. is available. Obviously, that will be without our, our, uh, our SOA extension. Okay, and is that uh, that that's a, that's a published paper? Yes, it is. Okay. On, on the question uh, on the information entities that I can see from Raymond Brookman, it is this an, an information architecture project ongoing that that are that started producing a white paper, and uh, that white paper will be soon be, hopefully soon be be released and. Use, that's the way you, the, the architecture forum usually works. Produce, we produce uh, white papers, and, and, and then at a uh, certain time, we, we take those uh, white papers and, and move them in, into TOGAF as appropriate. But it's, uh, of course, information entities will be extremely useful in, in, in non soa projects as well. Yes, indeed. Um, has anyone produced, I think perhaps this would be better be the, uh, the final one of these questions, and then we'll go back to how people can get involved. Um, Hi, Chris. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Yeah, well, I had a phone problem uh, trying to dial get through. I just have to dial again and again. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself, uh, Ewell, and uh, um, perhaps you could uh, maybe comment on uh, the, the, the question, has anyone produced any samples using the updated meta model and can these be shared? Uh, or perhaps also on a previous question, uh, which was about practical examples of the, the use of the practical guide. Okay. Um. Yeah, um, my name is uh, Awol Diko. Uh, I'm a co-chair of this project uh, and also co-chair of SOA Working Group. Um, yeah, we, example-wise, uh, we don't have a, we have a tutorial uh, that we use as fictitious company, uh, which explains uh, a practical guide. Uh, but for real use case, uh, case study, we haven't done that piece in this project scope. Uh, this was a uh, our focus was uh, really how one can position SOA within the uh, higher uh, enterprise architecture context, uh, linking various elements that are uh, involved in this uh, whole of enterprise, uh, enterprise architecture, like uh, governance, uh, reference architectures, um, the producing architecture capabilities, and so on. So from the start, uh, wh where is the SWA fit uh, from uh, at various stages of uh, iteration or uh, phases? Uh, so the, the practical guy really uh, what recommending or suggesting as uh, earlier presenter was talking about is uh, positioning SWA at high level, uh, starting from high level and drilling down uh, to the visualization uh, to the infrastructure. Uh, we haven't in this project the scope was not to uh, map to individual technology elements uh, like uh, I see some questions like uh, uh, SOAP, uh, RSPC, uh, REST and those kind of questions. Uh, it's not to, the focus was not to map to this uh, detailed technology aspect, uh, rather uh, what is the TOGAP and what's missing from TOGAP and what are things we can enhance in TOGAP uh, to make useful uh, TOGAP for SOAP projects. So uh, looking to guide, uh, maybe the next uh, detail, maybe mapping to the actual project. There was also a question around uh, vendors, uh, if there is any uh, real uh, vendor mapping to the meta models or practical guide uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, again, uh, the practical guide is uh, trying to link uh, many things uh, which will involve a big tool, of course, many tools, including governance, infrastructure, various enterprise architecture tools. So it's up to the enterprise really to uh, mix uh, best of breed or uh, suit to, to solve this problem. Uh, but practical guide is not recommending any of those, any specific uh, tool from vendors. Um, 
I think uh, uh, why was the other question correct? Yeah. Yep. Thanks for, for 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 providing those answers. In fact, we're now coming, I think, to the to the end of of our advertised time for this webinar. So, uh, I would like to thank again our our panelists, uh, Abel Dicko of the uh, Bank of Montreal, uh, Steve Bennett uh, of Oracle, uh, Dave uh, Hornford of Connexium. Uh, Matt Skenyaval of uh, Capgemini and uh, Ed Harrington, who gave the presentation from the start uh, of Architecting the Enterprise. Um, in terms of how people can get involved in these activities, uh, if you are a member of the Open Group or if your company is a member of the Open Group, uh, then you, you, you can find the um, you can find you, should, you can join the SOA work group. Any member of the open group is able to do that. Um, if you're not uh, yet a member of the open group, uh, we don't at this point have a mechanism for involving non-members in our SOA work. Uh, we do for the cloud work group. You can join what we call the cloudsters list. Uh, but we are looking at putting in place um, means by which non-members um, can uh, contribute to the uh, ongoing evolution of our SOA standards and guides, uh, and we can uh, be in touch with people um, who we have records of, if you wish, to wish us to do so, uh, as those plans develop. Finally, uh, we do have, in terms of getting in touch with people, we do have a number of questions unanswered. Is there a way, Simon, by which if... Uh, if we have answers to these questions, we can make them known to the people on this call. Uh, yes, Chris, we, um, we maintain a record of all the questions asked. So what we can do, I can uh, send those to you and you can ask, uh, answer those offline, Chris. Okay, so we will do that. And you will be uh, writing to everybody after the call with details of where to find the materials. Uh, correct. Everyone will get an email with a link to where they can uh, access the event recording. That will be tomorrow. Okay, so that's excellent. And uh, I'd like to, to thank, um, as well as our panelists, I'd like to thank very much everyone who participated in this, uh, in this webinar, uh, particularly those who asked questions uh, and uh, contributed to the flow of discussion. So thank you very much, everybody. And... Uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.